Good evening. Um, welcome. Um, before we get going, which is, I, I consider, a very celebratory occasion to have Michael Rotondi, but today um, somebody who I think is, was incredibly important in the culture of LA, and he has a relation with Sire Pass Away, Mac Davis. So I thought it was um, important for us to take a minute to pay our respect to somebody who has been crucial in shaping how everybody thinks about LA and somebody who was involved in SciArc. Um, it, it was hi highly, highly influential in many, many people. So it's a sad day that Mike Davis uh, passed away today, but um, so we wanted to take at least a small moment um, to remember him. And as everybody says, life goes on. So. Let's switch mode um, to welcome, well, not to welcome, to whatever is the version of welcome to somebody who is every day in his house. Um, there are many faces of Michael Rotondi in many ways. Um, there's a lot of people who are automatically associated with SciArc. Michael, for sure, is one of them. Um, Graduated in 75, was among the first group of students that joined the adventure of the beginning of SciArc. Uh, he was the second director of the school. He has been teaching in the school for all those years. And anybody who knows Michael knows that um, Michael has an infinite curiosity. Um, I was trying to think what is the best way to introduce Michael? And there is not the best way because there are many angles and many ways how you can talk about it, about his work, his teaching, his thinking. Um, uh, Michael, for me, represents one of those architects who thinks architecture is life. Everything is part of architecture. Uh, as I said, his curiosity is, in, in the best sense, is, is still have this, a child inside of him. Like, He's always trying to figure it out when new ideas come in, what young, young people are thinking, young faculty, students, and he never has uh, a preconceived judgment of any kind, of any shape or form. And I think that's what made him a remarkable figure within the school, a remarkable teacher, but also a remarkable architect. Everybody knows he has an extraordinary career as an architect and is still going strong. Um, originally part of Morphosis, then to Roto Architecture. And his work goes in multiple directions, in multiple trajectories, and trying to incorporate many ways, from very spiritual and metaphysical aspect to very straightforward, pragmatic um, understanding of new technologies, video games, or whatever else comes across his plate. He tried to filter into a way to see and understand architecture, which as I said, to me, is one of the best compliments that you can pay to somebody because architecture at the end of the day is in many ways a filter of culture, and filter of reality, filter of life ultimately. And for those of us who are lucky enough to be with his friends, every time that you have the chance to talk to him about any subject, you walk away feeling um, optimistic, feeling uh, energized. And we take sometimes those things for granted, so we tend to think about that of something of an emotional quality and not necessarily a rational one. But if we all understand that architecture cannot separate that, there is a rational and emotional act at any given time, then you start to elevate your appreciation of, of those conversations and when you look at the work. So, Again, to me, today is a, is a celebration as part of the 50. Michael is one of those critical figures that we need to hear from time to time, um, even though those who we are in the school on a regular basis, we get to do that. But it's important to always uh, get to listen where, what he thinking these days, what is the work that he's doing, where is he going with the work. And ultimately, as I said, um, we all can use always a reminder about the power of architecture and the power of architecture as a vehicle for expression of life in all the shapes and form. So it's really, for me, a joyful occasion that we have tonight. Um, so please join me to welcome once again Michael Rotondi to his house. I 
always ask if that light can be dimmed, but it, I know it can't. Uh, or can it? Then in, it's not code. It can be, people can't be in the dark. Uh, yeah, it's sad that uh, Mike Davis uh, passed. Um, I knew he was ill. I didn't know that he passed today, but um, first time I met Mike, I put the word out. Somebody had told me about um, people needing to have somebody at, at, at school uh, talking about um, the place in very specific ways that was, was categorized as urban geography. Um, Mike Davis showed up. And he said, don't expect me to stay very long. I stay maybe one to three years in a place. And he ended up staying uh, eight years. And I asked him, what would, what would keep you here? And he says, if you let me teach what I'm interested in teaching. And I said, what do you, what's the main subject you're interested in teaching? And he said, power. I want to talk about power. And he basically worked his way through all the different aspects of, uh, of power and stayed for eight years. In that time, he wrote City of Courts and a few other things, but he was uh, really a great mind and, and really a uh, major influence. Uh, thank you, Renan, for, for that. I think it was um, pretty accurate. I think, uh, um, I think architecture isn't just my life. I think architecture is life, um, and it holds great promise still. It always does with each generation. Um, one thing I should say to all of you that um, are just starting out, you got to be careful what you do in front of a camera. Everybody keeps those photos. Uh, I was trying to remember where I did the one where, you know. Um, I'm going to show another one of Tom and I um, after a full day of people photographing us in our office. They said, oh, do something silly now. And so we did, and that's the one they used on the cover, you know. But it's cool. It's cool. Um, I put together a, a less about presenting um, the work that I do and more presenting all the things that I've been curious about for a, a very long time and um, um, organizing it in a way, way where the work actually uh, is part of it. So, um, and what you'll see in the work um, is that there's no signature style. Um, I guess I could say that's intentional. There was a time when I, I, w I would say that there is a, that I have a, a signature process, but I don't think that's actually the case because it, it varies depending upon um, what the problem is that I'm trying to solve. Um, so I guess if anything is signature, it'd be my attitude. So um, yes, I have a signature attitude. Um, all right. From the center, uh, I believe that that um, at the center, which when in your youth you think is really the most boring place to be, from the center you can actually see everything around uh, if you're open uh, to looking at everything. So I like being at the, at the at the center. The presentation this evening will be a journey through 40 years of teaching and practicing. I'll present where my curiosities have taken me and what I've realized or discovered along the way, though the lens, or through the lens of an architectural mind that is curious, loves to wander and experience the unexpected. Also, my comfort level increases in proportion to uncertainty, not the other way around. My curiosity attracts me to anything unfamiliar, always wanting to know how something becomes something, as Richard Feynman would say, always through the lens of my architectural mind, which moves back and forth between both halves of my brain. Um, taking pause, I like to spend as much time as possible in the middle, which is the corpus callosum, and from there I can basically uh, begin to reflect on, on the extreme uh, places my brain is taking me. Um, and also, with just about everything I think about, uh, one thing that's really um, uh, important to me is always trying to figure out what's the architectural equivalent of that thing, that thought, that idea. So it's uh, always trying to figure out how do you convert, which I think is really, um, for all the students, it's one of the most difficult um, um, things to, be, to, to learn how to do, which is to convert 
any one thing into anything else, and that happens in, in a variety of, of ways. Um, and and it, it, for my generation, uh, and a couple after me, it happened in our third eye. So we learned how to do rhino in our head. You had to in order to survive. Curiosity is the engine of learning. We're learning machines. More on this later. And as Rene Debeau, uh, one of the authors that I read when I was working on my thesis, a microbiologist, um, uh, he was asked in a conference once, and then he wrote a book on it called Dreams of Reason, um, which is one of the reasons I uh, sort of prompted to want to know everything that I could possibly know. Um, isn't it so that all of the major scientific discoveries were really luck or good fortune? You open a, a window is open, and all of a sudden you discover penicillin, things like that. And uh, his answer to that was, good fortune favors a prepared mind. And so I began to wonder what that meant, and I realized that it meant taking in information all of the time, as often as you can, not knowing and, and not doing it instrumentally, like it's not a transaction. Yeah, you just take it in and you store it, and then it comes out whenever you need it. When I was very young, I made things before I knew how. When I was older, I may have known how to make things, but I didn't know why. In my formative years, I may have known how and why, but I didn't have a sense of direction. That came later. What I can be certain about is my motivation to draw and to model was to see on the outside what I was seeing on the inside. And I really was driven by that even as a, as a young child. Um, when I was a young child, I didn't make anything to scale because we had to use uh, basically lumber from construction side of my, my uncle. So we'd make everything pretty much full size. Um, and then into the, the brief history that I'll, I'll talk about, uh, all of the stories that I'll tell, it's important uh, to understand there's, there's two words. One is pentimento, looking from, from uh, present all the way to the past. So the, len the, pre the present is a lens through all the way to the past, which alters everything we know. Everything you remember in this moment is transformed by the context. So, so to say that something is a, is a fact or, or, or otherwise is very very difficult to do. Um, the Kurosawa film, Rashomon, showed that there could be differing accounts of a single event. Framed by this concept, the following story of a teacher practitioner who has been lots of places, met lots of people, and has seen and heard many new and surprising things worth remembering, acknowledges that memory is not an exact or accurate archive of past events, but rather it serves as a framework for giving us context, perspective, and guidance for living together in the present. And many of the things, um, in the, the, one of the wonderful things of being around this place is you hear lots of really great things. Um, some of them in informal conversations, um, some of them formally, but um, all worth remembering. So I take that in and then I put them out in some way. So it's likely that, that some of you are gonna hear things that you may have said first to me and that I remembered. Um, if I get it right, uh, you can claim it. If I got it wrong, uh, I own it. So uh, you're off the hook. Fact and fiction. This is um, uh, something that is uh, uh, critical to the way I make up stories in my head and the way I, under, I, uh, I remember things. My intellect, when it began to grow, was fact-based. Architecture, in my experience, was primarily an intellectual practice based on facts, theories, and metrics. This was essential to a native son living in a city of constant change and little memory. If any, and as many points of view as there were people. Things then began to shift for me when we began a project for an Igbo, a man of the Igbo tribe uh, in, from Nigeria, who had been displaced by the Biafran War in the, in, the, in the early 70s and was eventually going back, so he hired us to do a house. Uh, he, was, he was an MD, educated at, at uh, Oxford and Stanford, and he saw the world, which was unusual to me at that time. Uh, I thought that, uh, that, that he was purely of what he called Western mind. Um, but he would say things that were very, very puzzling. So he saw things, he saw the world through a hybrid lens of a Western intellect infused with the superstitions of his tribal emotional intelligence. 
We had very long conversations about this, and I began to, to sense that things inside of me were beginning to shift. I asked myself the question over and over again, what if I was able to integrate intellectual and spiritual practice? And what I mean by that is matters of the mind and matters of the heart. I had already checked the box of religion via art varsity Catholic altar boy for some years in middle school, which I enjoyed my spatial awareness of the grand spaces that, that I was in all the, all the time with rituals. It captured a really big part of my imagination. Eventually, this went dormant uh, as a young person searching, uh, a young mind searching actually, began to confront the limits of the dogma that we were being told over and over again and how it constrained my imagination and my creativity. So I exited that. I think that was fully cured uh, when I began to hang out with uh, people um, that started SciArc. Um, that would include, I think I saw Glenn here, um, but it definitely uh, was fully cured when I met Tom. And we spent 16 years in what I would characterize as my formative years of developing an architectural mind. Some years later, meeting two people as I approached midlife, uh, as it's referred to, uh, opened my mind and heart in very unexpected ways. He travels with me. Anybody that's interested, the hippocampus is where our, our long-term memory goes, and that's where the deep learning actually resides. In the late 80s, um, I discovered one plus one equals one, which was um, new math for me. I also, about a few months later, I was invited to participate in a, a private tutorial, just observing. Um, his Holiness, uh, and was amazed. I thought I was expecting somebody like the Pope, um, but I was humbled by his simplicity and just a degree of presence that he has. When I mean by presence, he, when he's talking to you, you can tell he's only talking to you, and just the compassion, which I knew very little about until he spoke about it for two days. And then uh, the Bee Man, um, who helped me in a whole variety of ways since he was a very young child, to reclaim uh, my beginner's mind. And then this is that silly photo, which is fun, actually. Um, uh, Tom, I would say, not only did we work together for 16 years, um, um, because I really like to listen and learn, he's got so much energy. Uh, I, 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 I characterize him as a, really a teacher. He was a teacher for me, telling me things that I imagined I had heard, but I didn't. Um, showing me things that I imagined I'd seen before, but I hadn't. And so my mind just expanded exponentially, hanging out with him for all those years. And then, of course, uh, Ray, who actually is not Italian, but he's always talking like an Italian, you know. Um, but he, he believed in all of us, you know. He, he, he was, um, it was unusual for uh, somebody with such an age difference to have such faith, such faith in young people. And uh, encouraging you by saying things, the worst that could happen is you could totally screw it up. And when you have your boss say something like that, you figure, I can work within those margins, you know. Um, and the one thing that he also uh, taught me, and it was, oh, it was all, it wasn't, it wasn't through um, uh, lecturing, it was, it was through my, my informal exchanges. We'd cut a deal when he asked me to do something with the graduate students, and I said, like what? And he goes, I don't know, they're just the graduate students, everybody's mixed together, and the graduate students have more education, more knowledge, and they're bored being in the same classes with the undergraduate. And I said, well, you mean like start a program? And he goes, yeah, start a graduate program, that'd be good. And I said, well, what do I know about starting a program? And he goes, well, you always figure things out. So, you know, just do it, you know? I, I said, but I don't know what I'm doing. And he goes, that's actually a benefit. You know, you'll invent something new. And he, he kept on saying things like that for many, many years. And then I said, okay, I'll do it under one condition. You give me the privilege that you expect to be given. So even if you disagree with what I'm doing, unless I'm really messing up, you don't overrule me, even if you don't like what we're doing. We hit that point. And I looked at him and I looked at straight at him and I said, remember the agreement that we had? And he goes, you're right. Keep doing what you're doing, even though I don't agree with what you're doing. And uh, it, was, it was amazing. 
Uh, and then uh, slow looking late afternoon. And then um, everybody's teachers. Um, this in particular, um, I was analyzing what I learned from my parents, and they didn't speak much. My mother would always say, you're smarter than me, you know, simplify it. But uh, what I knew is that the way children learn is by watching the hands and the eyes and what the hands are doing. And your imagination unfolds, I was told by a, by a, 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 um, a brain guy, a brain physiologist, your imagination unfolds at the rate that your hands move. And he was, he was talking about that with me, wondering um, what the next step was for how imaginations unfold when students aren't moving their hands. He goes, do people use their hands at, at your school? And I said, yeah, they're using a computer a lot, but they move their hands a lot. So you can see that their, their minds or their imagination is unfolding. Well, with my mother, seeing her look at somebody, uh, uh, she was a seamstress, so she'd see somebody in a dress, and she'd come home and draw it, and she'd cut a pattern, and she'd make uh, and make a, a sample of it. And so she'd go from 3D to 2D back to 3D, and then it became ultimately 4D. So my visual imagination. Uh, my father, who was a great chef, I would just watch him working with, um, it was like watching a chemist work. So I learned um, synesthesia and, and proportion uh, from him. And just cooking with intuition. And cooking is the same thing as designing. And then, uh, there is migration from uh, Italy to, uh, to Los Angeles. Ah. Fact and fiction. I set up a symbiotic relationship between fact and fiction, so uh, don't beat me up too much. What, part of what I learned, we used to do pilgrimages. April and I would make pilgrimages. It was, it was initially her idea. She said, well, why don't we find people in America that have um, a way of integrating intellectual and spiritual practice. And it was basically Native Americans. And uh, over, over time, um, I began to learn from Native Americans, the Tibetans, uh, Nigerian, Igbo, uh, among them, mythical stories and teachings set in real geographical places. That's what was um, where the fact and the fiction come together. Where in a, in, a, in a place that you could be standing, you could be reading a story of something of mythological uh, proportions happening there uh, in that place, but never altering the place, but telling you how that place fits into the, to the story. So um, South Dakota, Wyoming, New Mexico, uh, Tibet, Nigeria, Australia, etc. Um, it's where I began to understand the relationship between myth and reality, and, and, and in, uh, especially in the Lakota Reservation, the relationship between the practical and the profound, that they don't separate them out, where I learned in my experiences that they, they were separated out in our world to make life easier. So, um, okay. Essentially, when I reflect on my father and my mother, this is an American story told from the point of view of a son of an Italian immigrant who drove to Los Angeles 90 years ago from New York City, believing that Los Angeles was America, and it was. He invented a life and made it possible in his own way for his four sons to do the same. Inside our home, Life was based on multi-generational traditions. Outside, life was negotiated and improvised. No two families were of the same ethnicity. Our neighborhood friends were an eclectic group, searching for common ground. It was a young city with little memory and no expectations. LA was, and I believe it still is, a place for inventors, entrepreneurs, storytellers, explorers, and gamblers. This I'm always asking myself, is it possible to have a long-term vision in a short cycle world? Um, I, the answer is yes, but you have to work at it. This is critical to our survival. Um, everything in the universe is symmetrical. It's asymmetrical, symmetrical. Um, it all adds up to zero, and equilibrium is really what uh, um, all organic systems are trying to reach, get back to, I guess I would say.
how do you practice and teach? Um, over time, we all learn how to basically make it one practice in two different places. This is um, where I work at the office, and this is also, um, I would say, my home school. Uh, my curiosity is on those walls. And uh, I have to say to, to, to some of the students that are wondering if I read them all, um, I would say that, that they represent my aspirations uh, rather than achievements. So, but this is really, um, I'm, I'm, when the, the day that I graduated uh, from here, I was missing the place so badly that I decided that I had to establish a curriculum for myself that would take me all the way through till the time that I retire, which I plan to do two years after I die. Uh, that's one of my aspirations. And then um, um, this is one of my big, there's only 10 languages here. I'm sure there's more in the school. Um, so if there's any more, you can tell me. Um, it's amazing um, hearing people speak in tongues around this place. It's really great. Why architecture? This is why I like people. Um, when I'm doing uh, any project, I like figuring out, and this is programmatic, I guess, how strangers can become friends. I definitely like using both sides of my brain, the analytical and the spatial. Uh, I like solving problems and I like making things. That's, I always, always have liked uh, making things. And, and as I've said, I like to see on the outside what I'm seeing on the inside. And then just still to this day, as Hernan was mentioning, having my mind continually grow. Um, a thought that I had when my son was born and every time I see a newborn, uh, I think of this. Um, the same way at the end of the day, I can remember what I did. I'm imagining that from the Big Bang to the present, 14 billion, 13.8, but let's say 14 billion years. Why can't it be possible that all of that is packed in to a newborn? And that from that moment on is when we begin to forget. And so it depends on what you're experiencing on the outside that helps you remember what's already stored on the inside. But I believe that, 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 that at that moment is the quintessential moment of curiosity because you're having to basically get access to all of that. I don't think, I don't think we're empty when we're born. And one thing I thought about is when, um, uh, what we call the terrible twos aren't terrible twos. Is when you're finally moving through the world on your own. You have you're, you're starting to think about identity without even knowing the word, uh, or anybody talking to you about it because you can't really speak that well yet. But you're taking in so much data that converts at some point into information that your brain grows incredibly fast at this point in time. And I've been told it's probably the fastest that your brain grows. Um, we, we, our curiosity um, f makes us play for adventure, for exploration. Um, these are the kinds of questions uh, young kids would ask. Uh, my son certainly did. And after I would answer, he'd ask why again and why again. And by the third why, I told him I had to take a break and I'd go do some research. The questions like this, we can explain, we can describe what happens, but I don't think we really have answers to all the mysteries of life. These, this we can explain. Working in Costa Rica, where there's a lot of rain, a lot of mud, um, um, some, one of the parents, when we were, we were designing a school, asked, is it possible you could turn mud into a curriculum? And so I did that for a few days. And you actually can, actually. This is, the, this is what's critical about play. As, as you get older, you think play is only for children, and it's not. Uh, play is, a, is an attitude. It's, uh, it's, it's all of these things. And it's really essential to us continually growing. That's why hanging out with little kids is really good. Galileo. Research has shown that there's a subset of, of um, one of the genes um, that says that um, it's inside of all of us, and that uh, only about 20% actually act on it, uh, which is probably pretty good because airports would be even more crowded. Um, but I think the, the foundation is in the genome. Um, and then I became fascinated with looking at the notebooks of, of Galileo. 
Uh, and then I read a statement that, that um, humans are the one species that even though they find a place where they got food and they got comfort and they got shelter, they still wander. We have, in, uh, we've covered uh, the entire planet and that's what got me into exploration. And then I traveled this trail. This is now the new frontier as everybody is thinking about. Cool diagrams. And this I think is really uh, important. Um, uh, optimism. I, I believe you can't really be creative unless you're optimistic. I mean, you can sort of repeat creativity, but I don't think you can be inventively creative unless you're optimistic. That you, you have faith that, that there's something ahead of you that you can't see yet. So the glass is half full. In my notebook, I'm always, my notebooks, I'm always writing things down in ways that I can remember them and then I convert that uh, into things like this. Um, what I see determines what I know. What I know determines uh, what I make. Uh, who we are and what we manifest in the world, um, both in, in spiritual wisdom traditions as well as in, uh, in uh, quantum theory. Um, the observer is the observed. And um, that, that's, that's, that's a fact. I, we grew up, my generation grew up when it was a profession. It wasn't a discipline yet. Even though we were teaching, it was trying to become a discipline. And then, and then um, uh, in, I think intelligence was brought into architecture. I mean, it was always there, but I think it was brought in in a, in a, in a more didactic way uh, uh, with the Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies in New York, uh, Peter Eisenman. Um, and then eventually, um, a place like SciArc uh, has defined it as a platform. So there's, it's, it, it's, there's many things you're going to be doing with your architectural mind. Some of it may be buildings, but not all of it. And then um, uh, Hernan reminded me of a, a particular project that he thought would be worth showing. I tend to never show it, but I, I decided tonight um, to show it because there are two seminal projects. One is a house that my son lives in. It's his house. Um, and I decided to do the house. I was inspired by Carlos Carpa working for five to seven years on a project. And so I decided to do a, uh, I ripped off the back of my house when I got back from that trip and decided to go from sketch to construction. No construction drawings, uh, no design development, no physical models. And I basically were pushing myself beyond my psychological limits, which was part of the deal. And nobody saw it for four years. Tom was the first person that, that um, I came to see it. And I was afraid that it was just a total mess because it's like playing chess chess with yourself. So this, this is a uh, somewhere between concept drawing and a construction document. Handmade, um, this is a construction document. And I'd talk with the carpenter, and then he would build. And then I would have to see what he built. So that was that, this house. And then um, a little project uh, we did. Um, somebody had $39,000. Um, to build a cabin. It was a writer, a sanctuary in a, in a colony that had seven, six other cabins. And uh, so we did this uh, um, it was sort of design build. And there was no electricity on the site. So that was part of the, part of the challenge. And this is um, inadvertently, this precedes me working with the Indians, but because of all of the things that I was looking at and reading, it's sort of where the teepee meets the barn. I guess I was trying to reconcile the differences between uh, the indigenous and the settlers in this building, uh, but not in any overt way. And so you sleep in the, in the cave in the back and you, you create in the tent. And then we had to figure out ways of uh, making it more complicated so that we then had to make way, figure out ways to actually build it. Originally, these were, I think, three phases, but now they're all present, and they, they basically are ready to go on a moment's notice. Uh, I've, I always thought that when I was young, or any of us are young, um, the work is without context, and so architecture gives form to architecture. Um, the next phase is you use start to feel more confident, and um, you're starting to look at context, and architecture now shapes it. Um, and then finally, 
uh, with, in my case, a lot more confidence. You basically start with life and try to figure out how to, how to, how to turn that into architecture. And so the, 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 the three, um, uh, the framework for, for doing that is, is process, uh, order, and, and unity. And uh, one prime example of the process are the, the alluvian uh, fans in, uh, in Death Valley. I think this has all three. It has change and, and is shaped by gravity, which ultimately the, the, the symmetrical forces at play uh, gives basically that hemispherical shape. And this is always moving. You're just moving at, uh, at a scale and at a rate that we just can't see. So you begin to think about the scale of many things that we can't see. And things are always changing. Um, I think in part, uh, this could open a debate, but it's, I'm not interested in doing that now. Uh, climate change is not just a result of, of us messing things up. It has to do with the rotation of our galaxy around a great attractor that we can't see. And then process, this is a really extraordinary delta in, uh, in, in the middle of Africa, going from Angola down to Botswana. So it transforms from rainfall to delta back to desert. And then process uh, tools, which are uh, I'm always categorizing things, so I wanted to know all the industrial revolutions. And this is a kind of sampling. And this helps put my uh, new, uh, let's say, information into, uh, into context. And this is the one that we're in right now, the fourth, which is basically a hybrid of, uh, of uh, biology, um, uh, physics, and, uh, uh, and digital. And then now I think there's a, um, uh, what I, what the, the, mix, the different realities, uh, I'm starting to think of that, that, that we're in the first reality revolution. And then um, what surprised me, I was reading um, a, a book by a, a man from the Santa Fe Institute that had a phrase, combinatorial evolution. I said, well, what's that? Well, in biological evolution, things change from within. Combinatorial smartphones are made by pushing all of these things together, combining them. So I think we have both of those concepts at our disposal at this time. Every industrial revolution, about every 100 years, um, societies change and economies change, and then politics change, of course. Um, and they all go hand in hand. Um, science and then technology and then um, architecture is following in there somewhere. And then the social evolution, I was wondering, um, I, you know, when you read the certain great books, they talk about the age of faith moving into the age of reason. And one of the questions that I was asking myself, whenever there's change, what's lost and what's gained? There's always an upside, but is there anything left behind? And there's always stuff left behind. And uh, so through all of these, and then I'm, I'm being very optimistic, I'm figuring before the end of the 21st century, it's, we're gonna be into the age of humanity, even though we're into the age of uh, unrest right now. I really believe that we're in the early phases of things finally, um, we're gaining insight to come back together. Um, either that or we're going off planet, one of the two. I, 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 I'm betting on, on humanity. And then this is what's often left behind, which I think is really critical. Okay. And then process for me, um, I'm going to show process in a project. I'm just going to show you just a handful of sketches. I, uh, it's, it's, um, it's like comfort food for me, um, opening up, a, a, having a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil. Um, is uh, very, very relaxing, and it's a meditation. So these are just, uh, just a sampling. Sometimes with a calligraphy brush, sometimes it's squirrels, depending upon the project, and trying to get into a certain um, attitude, if you will. And then sometimes doing a drawing where you never, you, 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 don't, you, don't want, you want to draw a section, but you don't want the pen to leave the ground, so to speak or meeting with a, um, a client and just working it over and over and over for a few hours 
is really a lot of fun, working in plan and section with them. And then also explaining things like, how, how do you see what's in the plan and, and make a section from that? And, you know, so you work through stuff like that. And then uh, um, my, my um, uh, accordion sketchbooks, which are speculations that go on as long as the, the thing is, the paper goes. And then it, it even goes to just um, what I call visual notes. I was uh, listening to certain pieces of music and, and uh, the composer wanted it to be played differently each time. So this was his music notation. This is what I could surmise from his music notation. Now you could decide how far down the line before you turn when you're playing it. So that there was a structure to it, but the way it sounded each time it was played depending upon who was playing it. And that, that, really, that really fascinated me. And this is one of the construction drawings for my son's house simpler project. And then more visual notes. I was trying to understand uh, um, Galileo's telescope. And then we're doing a project for raptors. It was basically saving birds. And uh, so I was trying to draw birds, so to speak. And then more note taking. And then travel notes. Um, when I have jet lag and I'm up all night, I'll do things like this. And it's basically trying to understand the city through the lens of Los Angeles. And then this was sitting with a spiritual teacher. And then uh, this was one of the first sketches that April and I did uh, to design uh, the vests that I wear. They're basically work vests. And then order, um, the, the, what I, I'll show things that aren't architecture and then architecture. So this is the order that lies within. Uh, one of the great phrases in history is nature likes to hide and it finally reveals itself. Um, so I've used that, that, that concept, I'm trying to let order reveal itself to me on even topographies. So the, the mind uh, as we express it, some makes it easy and tries to do this. The body does, is doing that and uh, the machine mind is doing that. And uh, how to reconcile those is, is really a chore. And then proportion, now, we grow in proportion. Um, everything is in proportion. There's a book on scale, which is basically a book about proportions, written by Jeffrey West from the Santa Fe Institute. That's such a cute foot, isn't it? You just want to kiss it, and then scaling. I think one of the one of the there's there's um, lots of ways to, to 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 convert. When you were converting an idea into let's say finally into a building, um, you have to find ways to scale out. Scale shifting is one of those. I think metaphor is is another. Um, there's people here that are a lot smarter than me that can tell me a number of other ones, but um, I know of scale shifting and metaphor. This is scale shifting. And the most ordering that we were shown was really all symmetrical. Uh, being a, um, a trained as a, as a modernist, you, symmetry was against the law. Um, so when I discovered a book on, by Doxia, this um, coming up with a system of geometry in the Greeks, and, 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 and the Greeks never wrote this, it was an, an analysis, an analytic uh, process by Doxia, this, uh, that he started to find that there was recurring uh, spatial orders in putting down on temple sites, the buildings that look like they're randomly placed, and they in fact weren't. And that fast, that really, that really captured me. And then this is Borromini, so this is the kind of um, spatial order that um, um, it, it, it's, it's a tremendous chapel going between Ber Borromini and Bernini on the same street is pretty extraordinary. And then I was starting to think about because I was spending, I was going when we when we were traveling to Costa Rica, I was going into the rainforest, and I had already been to see the classical gardens and the Japanese gardens, and I began to wonder if the way we make things has, um, has something to do with the kind of uh, intellect and as I say it, 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 the the order that lies within our uh, our intelligence. And so uh, the rainforest is basically an emerging order, and you don't see any hands at all except the bugs. And, and the trees and, and the plants and the leaves. Um, in the Japanese, um, you, the, the hand of the gardener is invisible, but there's a harmonic order to it all. It's, it's, uh, you're always at the center walking through. It's very, 
very calming no matter where you are. So it's a kind of dynamic uh, middle path, uh, center line, um, point of equilibrium um, uh, moving through. And then you get to the classical gardens, uh, which I call third nature, which is imposing the order. And it's still very beautiful, but, but you're, you're using nature to basically um, make something that is, is, uh, is predetermined. Uh, which is fine, which is very different than the other two. And, uh, and then what structures, um, uh, just about everything is, is progressive and cyclical time. Mirroring the earth and the sky, working with the Lakota, um, learning about sacred uh, geometries from them. They have a system of astronomy and astrology that goes back 3,000 years, and it basically has what they, they read the sky um, uh, both as, as, as a science and as a myth. And then they bring them down, bring that information down to the ground and work it into their stories. And then that would determine how they migrated and how they would set up their camps. And so I was concerned that if we're, if we're, if we're building a, a new campus for them, are we going to make them sedentary and take them even more uh, into uh, the, in the other direction? And they said, no, we can basically scale, we can scale the sky down uh, to the earth, to any size, and ultimately it goes to the middle of your heart. This is the line or the zone of creation for them, and there's many, many stories that come out of this, and there, it's, it's, it's quite a, okay, order here. This is a house in New Jersey, and um, he wanted a simple house. Um, the more he talked to us about um, his ideas, not only not just about the house, but about the way he conducted business. It was it was very complex and very dynamic. So I asked him, "What if we took some of that 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 dynamic, that complexity, and I worked it into some kind of a geometrical order, and we built a, a house based on a complex ordering system?" And he said, "I'm open to that because he says it'll be unfamiliar to my eyes, but can you make it familiar to my body?" And I had never heard anybody say anything like that, but not wanting to get fired, I said, of course I can do that, you know? And so that, that basically became that. And what I discovered, uh, like Doxia, this is that you basically have a basis for making decisions all the way through the project that ultimately makes sense, even though there's uh, what apparently is a lot of chaos. And then bringing the, the hidden order out of, out of, the, out of the ground, on, on, a, on a project in the mountains. And then discovering um, in the lotus flower, I didn't know prior to doing this, that the lotus flower is actually a golden spiral. And so we wanted to see if we could not only use the golden spiral to, to, to scale it up and to do two different systems, one curvilinear and one rectilinear. Rectilinear is pretty easy be, because it's just a, drawing a rectangle around a golden spiral. And then the other one is more interpreting what's happening. And then you end up with something like that. And then a stupa for the Tibetans, um, uh, which is perfectly symmetrical, ratios two to one. Um, but I wouldn't have been able to do this uh, in my youth, but I was able to do it later on. Lama Zopa, who's an extraordinary lama. The benefit of doing this isn't making fees. The benefit is that you get to spend a lot of time with people like that, which is pretty great. And then Nagasaki, bringing the geometries of the seven mountains to the site and the geometry of shipbuilders as well. Um, listening to the music of the students, converting that, and making a building. Again, urban uh, geography, the geometry that lies in between buildings and then coming up with something like that. This was a, an amazing find. Uh, April and I were out in Joshua Tree in one of our trips, and this we discovered this. That's uh, just a scale of that is, whoa. And this is brief, because there's a lot. This is the Kepemni. This is, uh, this is the, the sky, the cone from the sky, which is where your sky spirit comes, meets on the horizon with your earth spirit, and on the horizon 
is where creation occurs, and the horizon in the human body, according to the Lakota, is the middle of the heart. And that's where the first separation begins. So that became that uh, st structure. This is definitely back and forth. That's, uh, and then I'll go through these quickly. These are, pro these are projects that um, we've been working on and some that are back in orbit. These are just houses on top of a mountaintop. Well, the mountaintop, that's redundant. A farmer and a vintner, a garage vintner, as it's called. What we did is it basically, um, it, it's a tribute. Um, I grew up in Silver Lake, and so the, the uh, um, the house, one of the houses we used to, we used to climb up to was uh, John Lautner's uh, um, uh, house in Silver Lake. And he completed, it with, he completed um, the site with a catenary. Uh, and I decided that on this one, we didn't want to use a catenary, but it was going to be a tribute to, to, to Lautner. So we basically uh, took a different ordering system. Like you can start to see the jaggedness of the mountains in the background. Uh, there's ways of pulling geometry out of that that basically uh, hit a horizontal plane and then our interpretation of it. And then this is really um, uh, a wonderful project uh, done for a really great um, uh, couple, Corky and Stella, um, in Angelino Heights. Of the first question the, the Historical Preservation Board asked me is like, why are you working in a neighborhood like this? And uh, I said, I've always wanted to work in a neighborhood like this. I've always been an admirer of Bernard Maybeck, so this is basically taking two of his projects and mashing them together. A gambrel and, and, a, uh, and, a, and a gable, and then trying to figure out um, um, how to get it to work. The house is in two parts, uh, living at the top and studio at the bottom. This is the studio at the bottom, and that's the, the house uh, up at the top. Client said, you know, I've always wanted to have a house. Do you ever see a, a, a car or a train that look like it's rolling down the hill? I want a house that's rolling down the hill. So that's, that's what this became. And it had a big, uh, they, they, they one and, and then Point Doom. Um, house, six months here, six months there. They wanted to be able to close it down. So the house basically closes down like a, like on a boardwalk. And then uh, this is, um, uh, I wanted to, we, we wanted to do a house that, um, uh, in Santa Monica Canyon, but it's, uh, is how do you get flatness and, and, and depth uh, with all straight lines? And uh, that's, that's what this one, among other things. But these, why I'm only showing elevations on this. And this one is uh, in the building department. And then in, uh, in, uh, in China, um, we were asked to recreate a garden villa. And when you study the garden villas of Suzhou, there is a distinct separation between private part of the house and public part of the house. And the private part of the house is very private. So we decided to take that literally and split the house in two and then connect them back and forth. So. And then uh, yeah, we had to put a, a three-story house on a, on a site that only allows two-story buildings. So we dug a hole, put it in a hole, and then uh, made it work. And then this is the main public hall. Um, and the client wanted to uh, um, finally consummate a deal sitting in meditation uh, with, with his, um, it could be an adversary, it could be a friend, but he wanted it to be very public, so we decided um, to put it into a, uh, basically a, like a fishbowl. And then this is the only image for this one. This we're uh, just starting on a, a little apartment building in, in Silver Lake, which is a fun little project. So I believe we used to be the software. I think now or, uh, now we've, uh, we, we've become the, um, the hardware. We're, being, we, we're shaped by the environment and it goes back and forth. Right. So context are all of these things. Pers the personal context. 
family context. My brother, um, uh, April was asking me if I was going to use this image, and I decided I would use it. Um, that's when I was four years old. Oh, shit, I was going to take my hat off. Sorry. But not polite. Um, what reminded me is my head at four years old is the same size as it is now. I think a head triggers birth. I think my head got really big and just like hit the button and I popped out at seven months. And I was three pounds and eight ounces. And uh, my head was that big when I was little. My mother used to come in and make fun of me. I mean, she, she thought she was being funny, but it would embarrass me. She'd say, you know, when he was born, he looked just like this. <laughs> and I say, mom, go away. Mothers do that. And then the B-man, playmates. It's great to have a, a son that uh, you enjoy spending time with as if he's just a young friend. And then uh, there's an inside story to that. Sixty-eight was a really um, loud year. Uh, assassinations, unrest all around the world like today. Um, and revolution was uh, coming from anger. And um, at the same time, which is always a curious thing, is that uh, Thomas Merton, one of the great uh, mystics of the 20th century, um, spending time with His Holiness um, and exchanging um, ideas and views and um, teaching each other about their respective um, uh, religions. And, uh, and then uh, all of the unrest that was happening at the time, all of a sudden, it, it, it basically goes on screensaver for a moment when things like this happen. You know, so uh, this is why it's important to keep moving forward. And then for all of us, um, great anticipation, um, revolution went from, it's, it, anger became a revolution and then it shifted to joy when we said, let's start our own school. And I think Sire truly, and I've said this before, uh, was born as a love child. Not to say that there hasn't been, you know, like in any, there's always lots of issues. Um, that when you're inventing, uh, it's trial and error. Things don't always work the way you expected them to work. But this was, uh, I was asked in, in China at a conference, um, and everybody there was representing universities in China that were, I don't know, 150 years old, 200 years, and they said, how does SciArc, how did SciArc grow as quickly as it did in, uh, this was like 10 years ago, 40 years, how did it do that? And the first thing that came out of my, my mouth, like a burp, was cooperation. And I really believe that. I, I, I know that cooperation is essential to the survival of our species, but I think it also was essential to the growth of this place. For those of you that have never seen the thesis pit without a lid, that's what it looks like. And then uh, a night of remembering, uh, Greg Walsh and uh, Eric Kahn. Uh, to uh, wonderful uh, teachers and architects. And then uh, Raymond Abraham. Uh, this guy just had a birthday the other night. <laughs> I think this was 25 years ago. It's amazing how quickly you age as an architect. So. And then peer-to-peer, uh, -peer. this is really, I think, what's fantastic about uh, SciArc is that I think, uh, you, you know, you learn a lot from teachers, but I think you learn more from each other. Thanksgiving is upon us, and once upon a time, everybody in the school got a pie. A little prompt, uh, that's a lot of pies. And then, uh, not remembering Robert Mangorin, but he hasn't been around for quite a while, and, and when I was going through all of my images and I found this one, I was just um, remembering just how instrumental he was in taking what I had started as a graduate program and actually making it into like an extraordinary graduate program uh, in, in the years that he was the, its director and also a really great teacher. And then Ray and Shelley, Shelley and Ray, Ray and Shelley, Shelley and Ray. Uh, I was searching for an early picture of them and, and found it. And uh, love finds a way.
when I made this map, um, I was m m mildly depressed for a moment because I've never moved more than two miles from the house I was born in. <laughs> now, what's good about that is I can drive around the neighborhood without my eyes open, which I only do by myself. Um, but it's really a great area to live. I mean, it's, um, I, was, I was living among all of these, you know, the Ennis house. I lived in this apartment for, for two years, the Manolo Court, or Sachs Apartments. Um, so we were surrounded by really great things. We didn't know what it was, but we knew that it was, it was, it looked cooler, uh, or in our day, bitchin'. It looked more bitchin' than the other houses that were more traditional. And so we'd make up stories about them and save damsels in distress and all of the rest, especially this one. Um, this was empty for many, many years. And then, uh, um, somebody moved into it, but then, uh, a really exceptional, uh, restoration and addition by um, one of our own, Barbara Bester, um, took this house to places that Lautner, I think, would have uh, wanted to take it. And then uh, my son's house again, try, that was one of the pressures of doing anything in Silver Lake, was can you do something that stands the test of time, how we organize. Japan, Nagasaki Bay, Alvera Street, a house on the mountain. This is a house that um, we just finished construction documents, and uh, um, the, the 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 other members of the team that really took the executive position and creative position with along with me are here tonight, H-E-D, uh, Brent and Dwayne. It has uh, been a long but really wonderful process. And this is where the city meets the sea. Um, and then this is a project that's been going on for seven years, and uh, we're just starting to build um, some of the things. It's um, a sanctuary for wolves. And what I've learned uh, is just how extraordinary an animal the wolf is, it's not like the big bad wolf, you know, they're always given a, a, a bad rap in all of the kids' stories, but they're really amazing, amazing animals. They can, they have insight. They have insight. That's Teo. And then this is what eventually will cover uh, part of the 160 acres, animals on one side of the, of the creek and uh, humans on the other. This is really surprising. I, I want to stop for a second. If this was humans, this would be the leader. In a wolf pack, that's the leader. The leader keeps an eye on it and makes sure none of, the, none of the pack gets lost. Who do they put at the front? The slowest, the elders, so that nobody gets lost. That's, that's, that's how wise wolves are. Are we smart enough to know what animals know? I was asked that by Teo. I said, no, not yet. And then on a big island, Hawaii, turning a 60-acre ranch, into basically um, a nonprofit who are in a bunch of building in town are, are wanting to bring all of their stuff here. And this is, you sort of don't want to do anything when you see land like this. But eventually we'll knit all of these, an organic farm and housing and um, conference center and uh, solar uh, research, all of that onto that site. Space is, is really one of the great things to read about throughout history. Um, I put the homie in places that I can't fit and then take pictures of them so that I can now imagine what that space feels like. And he's a good sport, actually. Even that one, he was complaining about this one. I said, come on, man, I'm not going to knock you over. And then all of the really wonderful imaginary spaces that we've been given in, in films, one of my favorite films. And then a roller coaster, uh, just, a, the, just a, the experience of space and then how one begins to reconceptualize and reimagine space after you've been on a ride like that. And then going to the second Mesa in uh, Arizona is uh, amazing. It's, it's amazing being up on the, on the second Mesa, which is the Hopi. They say that's the oldest settlement 
in the United States. And then being up in the observatory looking south, and then this we all know, and then this some of us know. Uh, I was asked, this is virtual within virtual, which is pretty fascinating to me, which I think we're, we're there now. And there's people here that can talk more about that. But this is one of the great dance scenes. I like Fred Astaire, but this is, this is pretty amazing. And then working with um, performance artists, um, one in particular, Hirokazu Kozaka, and then Oguri is a dancer, and then Yuval Ron is the composer, and they always ask me to help them design the space. And then this is a, a space within a, a building. I'm just wondering, I showed this slide once, I think it was here actually. Architects live vicariously. You design bedrooms you wished you had, you know. Um, that was one of them. You design swimming pools you wish you had. This is, this is five meters up and it's, uh, it's basically an old tank that's cut in half. And then this is a, a new 21st century version of that one on the house on the hilltop that I'm looking forward to seeing. And then this, I was surprised. This is actually the water line right there. And I didn't know that the top of the, the underside of the water reflects the bottom of the pool. And the whole back of the pool, I always wanted to do a James Bond uh, swimming pool. So the hillside dropping down, we were able to make the whole back of the pool all glass. And so the, the, the wife is a, tri, was, is a triathlete. And so the, her coach can watch her. And then first time I stood there when the pool was filled, my client says, whoa, look at that. Did you know that was going to happen? You know, and I would have said, now I'd say, no, I didn't. But at that time, I'd say, oh, yeah, I knew that, you know. Light. I do think God was a woman. Actually, Borges said that when he was asked to talk about the word, the word that he talked about was light. He said it's irreducible, one syllable. And you, it's something that you can't see. You can only see the index of it. You can only see when it bounces off something. And that, I'm, whoa, I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that. And then this was one of the questions my son asked. You know, how does that happen? But light is... Uh, gives us life. That's what triggers uh, photosynthesis, release of carbon into the soil so things can grow and we can eat. In this particular building, we're trying to figure out how do we do an ordinary building which is pre-engineered, but do it in a way where they can have a ritual because they were asking us, listen to our stories, and learn our ways and then start designing. So we decided to pull the building in two in order to capture the, the sunrise and sunset on the solstice. And then they would do rituals. And then just uh, quality of light out in the desert is always morning till sundown. It's pretty great. All, all of these projects, April Griman has worked with me um, as an as a informal collaborator, but also as a, as a, a, a miracle manner. She was, I basically was in charge of gravity. She was in charge of everything else. And then uh, a colorist as well. And then how to bring light down through cracks. This is her space, um, downtown LA. How to, how to change the color of light in a space. Architects tend to color buildings in order to show the building um, and, and to qualify different pieces. Uh, I learned by working with her on our first project together that uh, you can use color in order just to change the, the, the quality of the light. And it's not really about the, the color on a wall or a form. And uh, working another one with Hirokazu Another one with Hirokazu at the Getty. He said, we want to make uh, light 
into something solid. And I say, well, photons have no matter. How do we do that? And he goes, I think I know how. And uh, it took 45 minutes to dance from here all the way down to the end of the plaza, which is a, like a two second walk. And uh, it, 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 the, the name of this was Kalpa, which is basically uh, time beyond time in, uh, in Japanese tradition. And what we're expecting the light to be in uh, late afternoon. And then they asked us to make this building into a lantern, which we did. They asked us to make this into also a lantern, which we did. And then uh, various things that, ha that would happen out in the desert. This was in the gallery um, a while back here. And the objective was to not do an object or not do a thing or not have it really be an experience, but to basically, I wondered, we wondered if it was possible to basically be immersed in, in a cloud. And we figured out how to do that. Our birds are pretty great. They do sketch models too before they finish this. And what they do to test whether it's a good model or not is that the, uh, the female bird goes walking by and if she doesn't look but once, if she doesn't look twice, they know that, it, that it's not cool and they gotta rebuild it. And, and, and now that what they're saying is that is they, th they think they're speculating that it's true that uh, women basically in a whole variety of ways uh, determine the aesthetic in men. This is not Photoshop. The first settler in Desert Hot Springs, in the Coachella Valley, actually. I always love this detail. And I think you can't do details like that if you're educated, you know? Uh, so I've been trying to do details like that and forget about that I've been educated. That, that. I love making things. Wanted to make a building with no nails, so we did timber frame, all scribed joints. Wanted to learn about how to basically get a brick wall to wiggle or to dance. Um, rough and finish was what the client wanted. So we figured out how to balance that out, working with, um, with a really wonderful artist, Suzanne Lacey at MOCA. And then this was pretty cool, working with Finnish carpenters that were hired to do rough framing. I couldn't figure out in advance, so basically I had to come up with um, column heads that were like that. I mean, it was, it, we always need medical fact in order to say that, oh, I just wanted to do that. And then very fine detailing on a house. And then a place for people that are doing business all day to chill. Translucent concrete wall on Sunset Boulevard. And then taking uh, sheets of, um, of um, of uh, maple ply and making everything that's made in wood out of that those same sheets, layering it, twisting it, scribing it, cutting it, whatever. And then uh, Albert Frey was a really good friend of ours at, at the end of the last uh, seven years of his life, and uh, I asked him if I could. Uh, I was inspired by his house, and he said, well, why don't you just knock me off? <laughs> and I said, wow, architects don't say things like that, you know? So I said, okay, can I show you the drawings? He goes, yes, please. And so he, this was, this was uh, acceptable to him. This is also, Ray, Raymond Abraham would only stay here when he was out at the manor. And then um, close to the end, two civic works. We're doing, uh, of all things, uh, a studio. Uh, and, and it'll also have Institute for Media Creation um, in L.A., but the first one is going to be in Eureka. 
It'll be a, a small version of this. So it's besides doing all the production, it's finding as many places for people to hang out, to have coffee and donuts, and then inspired by the Mandalorian um, a, a, a stage, or production stage, uh, and uh, in people that we've been working with for the last uh, f four years um, doing um, domes, I mean doing spheres, um, uh, developing a, a special effects. There's a huge one, a huge one in, uh, in Las Vegas right now. That's used for entertainment. And then uh, on to a project that uh, we're hoping to get started in construction really soon is the Aquatic Center in uh, Long Beach as they say, the aquatic capital of the world. Oh, this is, I hope this works. Ah, yeah, it works, good. That was the main entry. The process here is, you, you see the egg, it started out as just as a, as a pure egg, but with Coastal Commission, maintenance people, programmatic changes, uh, budget cuts, um, et cetera, et cetera, uh, it basically, you know, started to move around, which is, which is, which is um, it, it's difficult um, in one way, but it's, it's really uh, fun in a lot of other ways to continually have people um, throw things in front of you to try to trip you up. But then when you have a really wonderful team like we do, um, everybody working together, you figure it out. And then scale, which is... Uh, ask the person next to you if you don't know who Abe Lincoln is, but that's his toe. I had a conversation a while back with some, uh, some, some friends and some uh, uh, acquaintances that were um, scholars in China. And I asked them, again, what's lost and what's gained? Um, what's lost and what's gained when you go from a village, um, which is where the social fabric is usually woven, to a vertical city, which begins to take that fabric apart? is there any discussion about a new way of weaving? And they all were a bit stunned by the question. And then um, we had a very, very long conversation over the next couple of days that never came to anything conclusive. But that's one of the things that we often forget. We think that, um, yes, progress is important, but what, what are we, what, what's lost and what's gained? What's gained and what's lost? So. Like, you know, you go from these really wonderful canals in, in, in Suzhou to the Three Gorges Dam, which is really tremendous in making that kind of a scale shift. But then, you know, 17 million people are displaced. And, you know, a lot of villages are displaced. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't do this, but you should also be thinking about what the implications are, are of anything that we do. And then a really great scale shift looking at, uh, at, at through, uh, microscopic uh, images, and then comparing that to the, the giant crystal cave, which is pretty amazing, actually. That's 190 feet tall, that crane. So you could do things uh, with shipbuilders that you can't normally do. And then just, this is definitely fun working with people like that. We know what keeps us together. Disney's got that figured out. But uh, this is what the, this is, this is the work of an architect. What gives meaning to the relationships? Starbucks has figured out how to make alone together work. I think SciArc is perfecting together together. And I think that's important to make note of.
pre-radar or no radar, fisherman is going after the tuna. He can't see the tuna, so he's watching the birds. The birds want the little fish, but they can see the tuna. So all of them are watching each other. Pre-global, I mean pre-digital. -pre This is unshakable. I really believe that we can, we do have Wi-Fi and blue, I, all technology. When you look at, you look at anything, anything that's been invented, it's invented a nanosecond after um, uh, something about the body is more understood. That was the telescope and the microscope came when Leonardo cuts open the eyeball. And then everything else now is because of all the brain research of the last uh, generation. Two really great, great dialogues. Um, a, real, a real dialogue. We come together for friendship, for teaching, a lot of teaching there, for teaching, for work, generosity. And then in Portugal, the freshman dance all year to raise money, which is pretty amazing. Social communion Italian style, social communion LA style. Human civilization has endured for millennia, fostered by its most fundamental biological imprint, survival. In my travels, I visited remote villages in the Americas, Middle East, and China. They're still vital, having endured for three to 6,000 years, evidence that the human enterprise is a great wonder and perhaps the most complex of all life forms. It's responsive, adaptive, innovative to any and all forces that challenge its integrity, transgressions within the species, the speed of change that challenges the depth of our memory, global interactions that challenge our local identities, being confronted by the autonomous logic of human institutional structures and their concepts of power, politics, and money, and forces of nature that are scales beyond real comprehension, let alone preparation. All of these issues and the potential problems that arise are hugely difficult ones and possibly can't be overcome in the long term. So why should we try, we might ask? Because it's the right thing to do. And because creative people like us like big problems. The bigger the problem, the bigger the, mic, the bigger the motivation, the bigger the smile. It's a gift to be an architect and a teacher. And it's a gift to have so many friends and comrades like all of you. Thank you and love to you all.